Just got done editing this interview. You guys are gonna love it. Before I do that though, I want you to know that I'm going to be in the comments for the next 30 minutes or so answering your questions. If there's additional questions you want me to ask the CEO next time I interview them, leave them below. Or if you're just loving the data points I get CEOs to share, click the thumbs up button below. That's your way of telling me you're loving this stuff and I'll get you more of it. Additionally, again, I'll be in the comments answering any questions you have. All right, for 30 minutes, enjoy the interview. All right, guys, what's up? Nathan Lackey here. Today, our guest is Chris Savage. He's the co-founder and CEO of Awistia, a web-based software solution that helps marketers turn viewers into brand advocates to grow their businesses. Now, more than 500,000 businesses across 50 countries depend on Wistia's products to build their brands like HubSpot, MailChimp, Sephora, Starbucks, and Tiffany & Co. Chris, you ready to take us to the top? Let's do it. All right, man, I already told you I'm envious of your video setup here. You're you're totally putting me to shame. (laughs) I'm just at my desk, man. This is yeah. how it looks. It's another, just another day in the <laughs> office. <laughs> All right. So we just said on the bio, but anything you want to add in terms of Wistia for folks that, you know, if they haven't heard of you guys, what you guys do? Yeah. I mean, I would just say um, we've been around for a long time. We're a classic overnight success, you know, failed in obscurity for many, many years um, and then figured out like how to build a freemium business. Um, and we just help small, medium sized businesses use video better. And that means, Analytics, see how your videos are performing, hosting, sharing tools, marketing tools, the ability to build channels. Like we have a ton of stuff to help people do that. Yeah. Now the context of this, what I want to talk about is something very unique to what you've done, which is an acquisition offer you got recently and and decided to do something totally off the rails, which was instead of taking the acquisition offer, raise debt and buy the folks out. So we'll get to that in about two or three minutes. But first, give us context in terms of where you're playing. So would you categorize yourself as kind of SMB mid-market enterprise? What's the average customer looking like? Yeah, it, we're in the SMB space. I mean, um, you know, there's a that's where we've set our target. I think like any business that's freemium, you end up um, you end up with customers across the spectrum, right? Like we're mostly SMB. There's some mid market. There's a little bit of enterprise in there. Um, but we what it means for like how we built the business is that like we have to be really efficient how we get customers. Um, we have to make a product experience that's incredibly easy, incredibly simple. Um, and I think also the other thing about the SMB space, as you know, is it just it takes time, right? Like it's hard to find all those folks. And it's hard to build that brand equity. Um, and so, but that's the path we've, to, we've chosen and it's it's been good for us. So, I mean, fair to say sweet spot for you guys is your, your $99 a month kind of pro plan. Was that accurate or no? Yeah, that's accurate. Okay. All right. So give us some, let's put this on a timeline and then we'll get to the, the recent event. So when did you launch yeah. the company? What year? Launched in 2006. Okay, 2006. So how much had you raised? Well, first off, when did you get the acquisition offer? Uh, what year? And how much had you raised prior? Uh, we got the acquisition offer in 2017. Um, and we only ever raised two angel rounds. So for a total of $1.4 million, we raised 650000 in 2008. Um, and another about 800,000, a little less than that in 2010. Dude, I did not know it was that little. I thought you had raised like five, six million. No, no, it was, it was a very, I mean, especially in today, uh, when we see how much people raise for a seed round. Yeah. Um, yeah, we raised very little, yeah, very incredibly could. capital efficient. And that was from the beginning. Like when we started the business, uh, my co my co-founder and I were both very fortunate in that we graduated college without debt. Uh, my dad was a professor and had a, a, a good deal. Um, and so we saved the the meager amount we earned the first year out of school. And that is what we used to to fund ourselves the first two years. Yeah. Now, 2017, obviously, was about two years ago. Give us a, before we talk about kind of logistics here, give us a sense of size of company at that point. How many customers were you serving? And if you can, kind of revenue range? Yeah. Um, I think the revenue range was around like, about like right at the time of the offer, I think we were about like an $18 million run rate or so. Um, And I don't remember the exact customer number offhand at the time. A couple thousand. Uh, Tens of thousands. Tens. Okay, good. That's, that's good range. Tens of thousands. Okay. So the acquisition offer comes in. Were you expecting it? Was it a surprise? Did you solicit it? You know, what's funny is that we actually had three companies approach us at the same time that all said, we want to acquire you. And (laughs) I, was quite surprised because, you know, people have pinged us over the years and poked around, but never have we had three companies at once. And it was the fact that those three companies came at once were like, oh, maybe something's changing in the market. And so we should take these offers more seriously. Um, And then it just kind of evolved, right? Like, you know, you don't really expect to be spending your time doing that. And then suddenly you're spending all your time talking to people about um, selling your company. It took all your time. I mean, it was super time intensive. 
it became very time intensive because, you know, there was like, we were, we really were not sure what we wanted to do with the business actually. So it was like, we had the acquisition offers coming in. We also had thought maybe we would raise a growth round. So we were talking to growth firms. Um, we like were how looking, much, what were you, what were you, what were you, if you did go VC that, that time, what would you raise? I mean, what I was being sold, what they were trying to convince me to do is to raise, you know, 40 million bucks, something yeah. like that. Um, and so we were spending a lot of time like looking at our data and looking at the unit economics and like <laughs> how things were changing and evolving um, and thinking through what we would do in each of the different scenarios. Yep. Okay, good. So you're, you're looking at kind of the VC side. Now, did that actually mature into a term sheet or you shut that kind of down quickly? Um, it was returning. It was turning into a term sheet almost exactly the same time that um, we were getting like the real offers okay. from the acquirer. Were they, did any of the acquisition offers turn into a real LOI or a real term sheet, real diligence? Um, we were just, we had gotten the numbers and like we were get, I think we had gotten to one, one of them, like the LOI to sign. Okay. So where did, I mean, when did debt enter your head? So it's funny because we were basically sitting there with this offer trying to decide like, like should we go to the next step? And, um, we realized in that moment a couple of things like, well, what would we do if we sold? Well, if we sold the company, we would work at this new company for two years and then we would leave. And then my co-founder and I, at this point, we've been working together for 11 years. We think we've worked together really well. Um, so we thought we'd do something together again. And we thought we'd probably try to build another company. And we talked about the type of company we try to build. And we're like, well, we really like the SMB space. We want to build a company with a strong brand. We think there's a lot of stuff we can do in video. You can see where this is going. Where we started to realize is that we were like, we saw the business we're going to try to rebuild with. <laughs> and then, then we're like, why do we need to rebuild it? And that was the funny part was like, I didn't expect that. Like, you know, why, why rebuild? And it was in that part of the conversation that we actually admitted to each other that we were not happy. Why? We had been throwing the throttle down on growth for a couple of years. And we had, you know, we'd been profitable and funding the business uh, through having customers and we, and we had cash reserves. And then we had just been like throwing the throttle down, like hiring like crazy, spending tons of money on advertising because we'd gotten so much advice and we looked at the market. We talked to all these growth funds and all these smart people who said, if you're profitable, then you're actually probably not growing as fast as you could. And so we were trying to grow faster and it had made the company incredibly short term focused because like if you lose $250,000 in February, and you're planning on losing another 250 in, in March, but revenue is going to go up. Revenue doesn't go up, and you end up losing 300. <laughs> it ends up creating some stress. How low and was the bank? Look, how low was the bank account? Did it get in that time frame? Um, I mean, we let's. That's a great question. I think we we started with uh, before we started to throw the pedal down. Um, we had. I can't remember the exact amount, multiple millions. And we were, we were trending lower. Like I could start to see a time horizon where we went from like living forever to, it was going to be more like seven months or something. Yep. Yep. Um, so that was very stressful. And, but what was happening is because everyone was so short term focused, the, we couldn't even execute on the long-term ideas. Like we do a long-term thing and then everyone would be like, why isn't that working? Why are we putting effort into that? And it would just made everything really short term. And it just was no, it seemed like, it was just going to be programmatic as opposed to like um, longer term bets on things and more creative work in our marketing and, you know, focusing on the experience of the product. Those things like kind of fell away towards just kind of short term growth things. Mm -hmm. OK, so did you end up having to lay off a bunch of people to get profitability back or? So we, we did not. So we're okay. very fortunate. So we decided not to sell. We realized that create that did create a misalignment with our angel investors. So we had to do right by them uh, because, of course, they want us to sell because that was going to be a great return. So how much did they own, by the way, the one point four million? Um, I can't say exactly. OK, but I'll say, you know, I, I, what I will say is that when we raised, it was a different time and uh, harder to get a higher value. So they, they own more than I would want them to. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, can you give a range and say between like 10 and 50 percent, 10 and five, zero percent? I can. Yeah, sure. They're in that's that a range. big, that's a big range, right? So <laughs> it's a huge range. I mean, the reason I said it is because, um, I, I'm thinking going, okay, an $18 million AR company that's raised 1.4 million, him and his co-founder are unhappy. Why do they feel like they need to do anything unless those early folks owned a material portion of the company? That's exactly right. And it's, it's because like when we raised our first round, our MRR was literally 
one thousand dollars or yeah. like fifteen hundred bucks. <laughs> so it was like we were very very early, and there was a lot of risk in the business. Yep. I mean, I give credit to our angels. Like I. If I saw a business that was just doing fifteen hundred an MRR and it was like the stage at this, I don't know that I would be able to make the investment. Yep. Um, so I give them tons of credit, but yes, it meant that they owned a, a material en- enough amount that they, you know, their their shares also were preferred shares, and so it meant that they had rights to a board seat. They could block a sale. They, we tried to set ourselves up because we assumed we were going to raise venture money, so we tried to make the terms pretty venture-y, so that if we did, the venture capitalists would come in and be like, "Oh, these seem like fair terms." We'd hope that they would like be closer to aligning with that. Did any of the, the, the second $800,000 round in, in 2010, was it a priced round or was it another note or something? It was a priced round. Okay. So there was at least a valuation kind of beachhead mm-hmm. for you to look back on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Totally. So I'm one of your early investors. I'm going, dang, Chris, I wanted you to sell for $180 million. You guys aren't going to sell. I'm bummed. Like now what? what gonna, yeah. <laughs> so basically we started hitting on this idea of um, what if we were to raise debt? And we kind of like took future profits and brought them now. And we were to create a tender offer for our investors. And um, we structured this. We, I talked to an entrepreneur who had done something similar. Um, and the idea like got in there. And I thought this is a very interesting idea because it was the same terms to everybody. And so we decided not to sell in like June of 2017. Hit on this idea of doing debt in probably July Um, and by October we had terms. And so we worked with Excel KKR, um, to fund the debt and they were willing to write debt against a company that was not profitable. Like we said, we're going to be profitable, but they had a growth fund side of their business. They have a growth fund side of their business. So they looked at the unit economics of Wistia. They, they were taking a bet that they understood our unit economics. We understood them and they could see a path to profitability. And we had a range of debt that we would raise from them. And so what was that range? They were, it was like 15 million to 20 million. They were comfortable underwriting that. So then we went back to our investors, but we also went to the team because the team had options. And especially early people, they've been taking a huge risk and making incredibly small amount of cash in return for equity. So if we're not going to sell the business, we have to take care of them too. Um, and so we basically went to everybody and gave them the exact same terms. It's just like, here's a valuation. You can decide how much you want to sell. And write in how much you want to sell. Um, but for the investors, what we told them is like, Brent and I are going to run this business for the long term. We have common shares. If you don't sell, your shares are actually going to convert to common as well. How could you so force them the, to accept that ter- accept that term? You guys just had control? So basically what we told them is like, uh, we've been doing this a long time. The business is materially different than it was before. We're going to ask your class of shares to vote to turn into common and that will trigger the ability for you to sell your shares. How did you convince them to the vote yes to that? Was there anyone that stuck out and said, no, I want to stick with my preferred and stay with it? Um, there were some people who wanted to stick with preferred, but there was enough people who were excited about the return and so thankful for the return that they were able, you, we just needed a majority of people to do it. So that was not that hard to do. Was I that- will also say we built up so much trust because they've known us for so long um, and they, we had basically done what we said we were going to do. Like even when we raised our second angel round, we said, we're going to get profitable on this. So we said, no, you're not. But like, we still think it's a good business. And then we did. And they're like, you did. No one ever does that. And it was just like kind of continued on that path. Um, and so I think there was like definitely a trust element involved. Uh, what return did you, I mean, did you pitch them on a return when you raised? Did you say, hey, we're going to optimize this to get you a 10x return? You know, we didn't, I, I was not a fan of saying an exact number at the beginning. I was always a fan of like, when someone asked me what the market size was, I'd be like, well, I don't want to tell you what the market size was, but I will tell you, if you look at WebEx, you look at GoToMeeting, you look at the number of people over there, if they were spending just $50 a month, that would be a big market. People would be like, that would be a multi-billion dollar market. You said it, not You're me. You're like, that's the math. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, cause that is what we thought it was going to be. And, and, you know, there was things where there were a lot of stuff we we're right about. I think one of the things we were very wrong about um, in the early days was just like the speed that our market would grow. Yeah. Like, we thought our market would be like two years giant. I mean, and what we didn't understand was that like, at least for business video, people wanted to be, they were nervous about the brand impact and then they're nervous about getting a camera and then they're nervous about the ROI and all of these things have been like a governor on our market. So our market's been a, a very, very good market, but it has taken way longer than people expected. And you can look at the the list of competitors we've had in the past, and many of them were overfunded, actually, and that's why they failed, because they tried to get the market, and the market wasn't there. 
then they had a giant team and it, they couldn't support it. And so they'd get sold off or whatever. What's your team size today? Uh, about 115 people. Okay. And was it about the same back in 2017? No, 2017, we're about 78 people. Okay. So back to the question about convincing enough of those series, those early investors to want to convert to common, you had to have, I mean, there's a negotiation there. You had to have given them a return that made at least the majority sign off on those terms. So yep. what was that? I mean, what can you share what that multiple was? Um, yeah, I can. Uh, so there's the two rounds. So there's different um, returns, but uh, it was around 20x. Okay. On, on kind of both of them. Yeah, one was a little one was a little less than that. Got it. So if I put some money in the eight hundred thousand dollar round in twenty ten, uh, your your I mean, what you're saying was that's essentially turns into sixteen million bucks. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Got it. And then so sixteen million plus again, call it another twenty x on the six fifty. That's where you get up to like basically. What I mean, you didn't raise twenty five thirty in debt though. You raised what seventeen. We raised seventeen point three. So here's the other interesting thing is that we're getting um, pressure for liquidity. People wanted liquidity. And don't forget, we also want to take care of the team who were to sell their shares. Um, but people didn't actually want to sell the whole thing. Like, oh, you know, so we had probably had like 12 individual investors. We had a couple people who didn't want to sell anything because they're high net worth individuals and they have lots of investments like this. And they're like, well, let's just let it ride. Yep. And they they knew that they would be incentivized the same way Brennan and I are like running the business to figure out how to take money out of the business at some point. So, so of the like, 1.4, how much did you can you buy out basically, the 1.4 million? Um, that's a good question. Uh, it was 40 ish percent, 40 percent. Okay. Well, that's less than what I would have thought. Okay. So 60% of people said, I'll go to common. I want to ride this bad boy out. Yeah. And it, I mean, that was actually one of the people who gave me the most pressure for liquidity. I was just so certain they're going to sell like, you know, 60 or 70%. He came back. He's like, I'm going to sell like 20%. I was like, are you serious? That's so After funny. This? It's like, He's like, well, you guys are doing great. I want to, I want to be in this that's business so, for the long term. That's like, so funny. So forty <laughs> yeah. percent on the one point four million from the six fifty you raised in two thousand eight and the eight hundred you raised in twenty ten comes at about six hundred thousand dollars of the one point four you bought out at a twenty x, right? So six hundred thousand times twenty x is twelve million. There, you then had more debt on top. You had, I think you said you raised seventeen in debt, so you have five left to play with. Did that go out of the balance sheet and early employees who exercised? I was really there was nothing went on the balance sheet, so it was all okay. just. Early. Yeah. Okay. It exactly matched. Okay, cool. So that's really helpful. So, so out of curiosity, I mean, did you ever do the math? How many team members sold at least a dollar worth of shares in the tender offer? Um, most did. So really? we okay. actually, when we did the offer, what we said was we want to have one incentive structure for everybody. Um, so you can either, you know, hold on to your options or if you sell your options, you can participate in profit sharing. So we introduced profit sharing starting in 2018. Um, where we take a percentage of the pool of EBITDA and put it directly toward for the employees, and it's divided up based on people's salaries. Um, and we did that for a bunch of reasons because we audit salaries multiple multiple times a year to make sure people are paid fairly and equitably. Um, that way, it acts as like a bonus, and there's a very clear connection between how the business is doing and. Um, how people are compensated. So in, in this year, wrapping out uh, of 20, 2019, let's just assume, let's say you took 5 million to the bottom line. Do you split the full 5 million or do you take a percent of EBITDA and split that? We take we take a percent of EBITDA because we're serving the debt. We got to pay taxes, a bunch of other things. But okay. um, that's how that's how we've done it. And it was actually very interesting. And it, I, it was a huge lesson for me because you know, we had given people options forever and they would talk about like, what's the valuation of the business? I'm wait, like, before well, you tell, but wait, before you tell the story, what, what percent of EBITDA, EBITDA do you end up splitting? Uh, 10%. Okay. Now tell the story. Yeah. Yeah. So we basically, you know, we, people would ask like, how much is the business worth? We'd be like, well, you know, you can look at SaaS multiples and they look like whatever five X to 20 X. And you look at like these other industries and it was just like fuzzy math. And I think it made it really hard for people to understand what to do. Like how valuable is this thing? Like, you don't know when liquidity is going to be. And so it used to be the case, like on a monthly basis, we'd go through our financials. We would open book at Wistia. So we'd talk about the financials and like any questions. And usually there'd be no questions. So the first time we went through the financials after we introduced uh, profit sharing, it's like any questions and like, you know, <laughs> half the hands of the room went up. <laughs> this is your all, hands, like, your all hands meeting. Yeah. And they're like, why, why do we have this extra office that like doesn't have enough, you know, we're basically we're wasting space and that like, we should be subletting this. And like, why are we doing this thing over here? And why are we doing this thing over there? And it was ludicrous. Actually, it was crazy to see the difference. And then after that, one of our, uh, our infrastructure teams came to me and they're like, 
hey guys, we have an idea. We think we can improve gross margin. Well, by the way, your video, how bad was your gross? I mean, not, not bad, but what was your yeah, gross but margin? Our gross margin matters. Like it's expensive. Um, uh, the cost of goods of delivery video and hosting video, the storage, everything is very expensive. So they came to us and were like, we think we'd improve gross margin. We're like, all right, great. They're like, how long do you need? They're like, we need a few weeks. So they went and they spent some time and they came back and like, um, we've made some changes. We've reworked how some things are, are working and we've got us three points of gross margin. That's amazing. So what does that equate to in terms of bottom line profit? They added just by doing that. Um, well, I mean, that is just 3% of revenue, right? Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, 3% of 18 million. It, yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, the point is like, this is so fascinating to me. People don't understand equity. They understand like profit. Cause now you said these are dollars that are not in your wallet. If you don't figure out how to save them. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And I think it's, it's also, it's been interesting too, because like, you know, we're still growing, we're adding a lot more people, we're trying more things, but the, by having this, it's almost like it forced us to be profitable, the debt, and that allowed us and forced us to be long-term focused which again, these are like the opposite things I expected way before all of this would happen. Like I always assumed that, you know, people said profit was bad and profit was short term. Mm -hmm. um, it's just been interesting because it's been the opposite. Well, so now fast forward, you're two, three years into this experiment. How many customers are you guys serving now today? Um, a lot more. Um, <laughs> so that's, I could say that. Are you over 50,000? Um, um, yes. Okay. Uh, and I would say, and I would also say like the, the revenue is really strong. Um, we are more than double where we were then, which is awesome. So you'll break like um, four, wait, double 18 is four. You'll break 40 million this year. We, yeah, we're right, right past there. That's great. Uh, yeah. So Chris this is amazing. Cause so there are so many VC firms that sell entrepreneurs on this idea that you're never going to double growth unless you like raise capital, but like you've proven in a very opposite way that like it actually is doable, even though you yourself will say your market is not a massive multi-billion dollar market. Yeah, I think that it, it is totally doable. And I feel like I, I look at a lot of, actually, I take inspiration from companies like MailChimp that have done it without any funding. But I also take inspiration from companies like, I feel like a lot of the direct-to-consumer companies are showing us what's possible. Like if you can find the people who really care about what you're doing and you can figure out how to finance the, um, the business, like through customers, through cash flow, uh, it, is, it is possible to do. And it's also just like people underestimate focus, man. Like, yeah. You know, we were we were doing so many different things, like searching for growth, and then the second we focused on our product, we focused on the experience because we had to. Guess what? All those things got better, and then moved the needle. Yeah. Well, and so how? What did you move the needle? You said since twenty seventeen you doubled, but if you're doing forty today, what would you start the year at? Do you remember? Uh, what? Um, I don't know. Okay. I I yeah. Okay, but you're, I guess the reason I'm asking is, has the team? Because the team can save money and it essentially ends up in their pocket, have they made irrational decisions around CAC, right? They could have spent a dollar profitably, but they didn't because they wanted to save it for their pocket. It was a guaranteed thing. Oh, that question. Um, no, we haven't had that experience because I think the other piece is that the profit sharing is, um, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a part of your competition, but it's not a huge part. Yeah. So we're also just like making sure that we're paying people really well and, and doing that throughout, you know, as we update um, where people are at throughout the year. And so I think it ends up being like important, but it is not like the key piece of your conversation. I think we'd get a very different result if profit sharing was like 50% of people's compensation. Yeah. What, um, what, it's much smaller percentage. When you look at like your marketing team, again, with this profit share model and CAC, I mean, are you, are you still optimizing for like a, a kind of a year long payback period or is it shortened or, or lengthened? Um, yeah, it's, we're optimizing for about a year. I think if anything, it's lengthened a little bit because, uh, now that we have this, bu this buffer of profitability, we, we can continue to do those long term things. Um, so yeah, that's that's an interesting one because I agree with you. It would have been easy to see it like change behavior so that people didn't want to invest, but we haven't seen that. That's I mean, that's a good thing. And then break down that so one fifteen on the team, how many engineers? The product and engineering organization, which I'm just gonna lump those together, sure. uh, is about I think like 45 people. Okay. So healthy. And then at your price point, I mean, do you have inside sales reps with quota or no? The the inside sales doesn't make sense. Uh, no, we do have six. Oh. Okay. How many quota carrying reps? Uh, like AEs at BDRs, you mean? Yeah, yeah. However you, whatever you want to label yeah. them. Yeah. 16. 
Okay. Did you change anything about their comp plans? Because now, you know, usually you have base plus commission, right? But now they actually take mm -hmm. their profit that they can share. And do you change their structure at all or no? We No, we didn't change their structure. Okay, cool. All right. Last question. If, if an entrepreneur is listening right now and they're thinking about raising debt, I mean, what, what terms are good terms? I mean, what, what should they be asking questions about? Yeah, I think you want to know. So there's obviously the interest rate. Um, in our case, you know, when we did the deal, the initial interest rate was high because we didn't have evidence of profitability, and so we were not going to go get the deal from a from a quote normal bank. Yeah, what I mean, um, can you give me? I know you probably can't give specific. Yeah, I'll say it was like I, I can't say specifics. It was like over ten percent. Okay. Um, and we had a five year term, and um, fortunately, we had like a the it was interest only for a while, and then eventually went into principal. And in our case, the things that we were looking at was like the interest. The, it was okay to spend that the the money on interest because we were thinking like, what would the value of the company be in the future? And like, you're kind of taking a bet: will we be worth more than eleven percent a year? Um, and then the there's always going to be covenants, and so you want to look at how the covenants are going to restrict how you run the business. And so um, things to look out for are like minimum revenue requirement, um, the amount of cash you have on hand to pay for the debt payments, um, trailing EBITDA and leverage ratio. So leverage ratio is the amount of debt you have to the amount of EBITDA you have. And like, if you EBITDA can usually or top have, line ARR, um, EBITDA, EBITDA. Okay. So when you, the, if you are at like four times EBITDA, so if you have a million of EBITDA, you can have 4 million of debt from there on down, like three, three to one, two to one, one to one. That's when you're getting into a range that you can like talk to normal banks. Yeah. And so you, you were over like five, you were over five or six, right? Oh, we were like infinite EBITDA when we started yeah. talking. Cause you weren't, so, cause you weren't profitable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So they had a plan and we like worked with them on this. Like we built projections and it was like, all right, in 18 months, we're going to have a leverage ratio. It's going to start at 20 X and then it's going to work its way down. And that was one of our covenants was like, can we get our leverage ratio to be in line? Right. Yeah. Um, I think, that's it's important to pay attention to those things because those are the boundaries of the incentives for you. Yeah. And like I think SaaS actually can be incredibly powerful um, when matched with debt because if you understand your unit economics with enough enough depth, like if you understand churn, if you understand expansion, if you understand acquisition, you can actually model out what like what should today's revenue be worth in a year. It makes it much more possible to use debt as a tool. Um, and in the, uh, like, you know, when we refinanced, we worked, so we were, oh, wait, so you're, you're not, you're not still paying more than 10% interest. You refinance. Yes. We refinanced after a year. Okay. Um, was that equal to the so, interest only period? Yeah. Okay. Got it. Yeah. So we had like, uh, in 2017, we had negative EBITDA of half a million. Yep. And in 2018, we had EBITDA of six million. Positive. Yes. That changes your and loan so profile significantly. That you changed the profile <laughs> dramatically. And so that meant we were able to go out and talk to normal banks and they ha we had evidence of profitability um, and they were excited about that, right? Like, so they, Excel was taking the bet on, could we get to being profitable? And then these other, these other um, banks are basically taking the bet, like, will we be able to maintain profitability? And so it's a very different risk profile and it's, you know, a lower risk profile to have evidence of profitability, which means that you end up with a much lower interest rate. How low um, could you I drive it say, with 6 million profit? Yeah, I can't say exactly, uh, but I, like much lower than Mo 10%. Less than half a 10? Uh, <laughs> you're so funny. I love it. Um, Chris and I know, just spent a bunch of days together in Maine. I'm going, Chris, I promise I'm not a douchebag. Like, come on the show. Yeah, It'll not be fun. Less than not less than half the 10. Okay, f fair <laughs> enough. But you were able to save significant cash flow, right? Now that you had EBITDA. Yes, yes. Yeah. Can you share the bank you work with? I mean, do you like them? Do you, would you recommend yeah, yeah, people reach like out? Yeah, them. They're called the Provident Bank. Okay. Um, yeah, they've been great. Okay, there you go. Very good. All right, let's wrap up here, Chris, with a famous five. Number one, favorite business book. Actually, for you, let me do favorite like book on creativity and like art. Oh, um, I'll go with Creativity Inc. by Ed oh, Catmull. Come on, that's like a businessy. Okay, that's fine. Give me one that's like a weird creative. I mean, because I know you study this stuff. Give me like a weird creativity psychology. Um, hmm. not mainstream. You know what? I, this it's another business book, but I think about it as creativity is uh, Masters of Doom. Okay, that's a good one. I haven't heard of that. Masters of Doom. 
Number two, is there a, uh, what's your favorite or is there a CEO you're following or studying right now? Um, for a long time, it's been Ben Chestnut, the CEO of Mailchimp. Yeah. Number four, uh, number three, favorite online tool for building your business besides Wistia. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, Chris is a self promoter guy. He's even bigger than me. Yeah, I mean, he's I'm going to say, say Wistia. Wistia. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> you use Mailchimp? Um, uh, a little bit. I, I know. I, what is? I, I really want to give you a good answer for that one. Um, this is another one where it's good to like not be mainstream. Some like weird thing you use to do some awkward thing within limits, Chris. Let's not get crazy. Yeah, we don't want to do too crazy. <laughs> um, what do you use to edit videos? Personally, what do we? I mean, we personally. Yeah. Um, Final Cut. Okay. Or actually, no, Premiere more recently. Adobe Premiere. Interesting. Okay. You guys ever get into yeah. the editing game or no? I don't think so. I think, uh, I mean, we're in it a little bit with Soapbox, but I think that the true editing tools require like a totally different approach and set of tools and different culture to build. Yep. Number four, how many hours of sleep you getting? Trying to get eight and a half. That's good. And situation married, single kids? Uh, married and two kids. Oh, two, gosh, you have your hands full. All right. Uh, and how old are you? 36. 36. Last question. What do you wish your 20 year old self knew? Probably debt. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, yeah, I wish if I, I, I wish my 20 year old self, um, my 20 year old self wanted to reinvent absolutely everything, like every single thing. Oh, it's not customer support. It's customer happiness. Like it's not <laughs> like ev every single, every single thing. If it's been done some way before, I thought that way was stupid. <laughs> and Chris, <laughs> you were wrong. There's a bunch of the things that are just the same in building a business. You should have been more open to that and it would have not caused you as much pain. These CEOs rarely give these kinds of interviews. I hit them hard, I get the data, and I wanna do it more. So if you wanna get more of this stuff, make sure you subscribe up here, and then additionally, go check out one of my other CEO interviews right now.